This episode of the Productivity Podcast is brought to you by Gusto. Now, what is Gusto? Well, it rhymes with musto or rusto, as in let's do it once more with Gusto. And Gusto is easy online payroll benefits and HR built for modern small businesses. You can get three months for free when you run your first payroll. Just go to gusto.com slash timecrafting. But I'll have more to share about Gusto during this episode of the podcast. So stick around to learn more about Gusto. This episode of the Productivity Podcast is also brought to you by the University of California, Irvine's Division of Continuing Education. If you're trying to start a new career, build a company, or better develop an appreciation of the world around you, UCI Division of Continuing Education has the resources needed to support your undertaking. I'll have more to say about the UCI Division of Continuing Education during the podcast, so stick around. But for now, let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Productivity Podcast. I am your host, Mike Vardy, and you're in for a real treat today because my friend Cal Newport is joining me on the show to talk about his new book, Digital Minimalism. He's the author of six books, and we've had him on the show before to talk about deep work, which is one of my favorites. I've chatted him in previous iterations of my podcasting life when he first released So Good They Can't Ignore You. Cal's an associate professor of computer science at Georgetown University as well. So he's a smart guy. I've had the chance to have dinner with him uh, when I've been in DC. We've known each other for a long time and we just dive into a lot during this episode. I, I had a real great time chatting with him. We talk about what digital minimalism is, how digital minimalism, the new book, is kind of an adjunct uh, or even a companion piece to deep work and so much more. So let's Let's just get into it. Here is my conversation with my good friend Cal Newport here on the Productivity Podcast. Enjoy. I'd like to welcome Cal Newport to the Productivity Podcast. Cal, thanks for joining me today. Of course, Mike. Always happy to chat with you. So your latest book I'm holding in my hands. I'm holding a galley. I'm, I'm holding the book that it's not going to look like this when it hits the market. We're, we're actually recording this in advance. But Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. And as soon as I saw the title of this book, first off, I said, what? Wait a minute. He wrote like his big book. Deep Work is the book. What's, what, does, what, what does he have to say in here that's going to be uh, eye-opening? And there's, believe me, plenty of stuff in here that's eye-opening. But my my first question to you, and I'm I'm kind of throwing a, a, a fastball right down the plate, and maybe you'll hit it, maybe you'll miss it, I don't know. But uh, minimalism is such a hot button topic. It's such a buzzword. It's it, it's it's in the zeitgeist in a big way. What 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 do you have to offer in the space of minimalism that you feel isn't ha- hasn't been served yet? And and where does digital minimalism fit into maybe the ethos of of this idea that people have of minimalism as a whole? Well, the the big ideas behind minimalism have been around back to antiquity, <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's, it's it's quite old, right? This notion that less can be more, um, and so this this has been around for a really long time. Um, we see it in antiquity. We see it in the great wisdom traditions. We see Thoreau really work through a, a pretty thorough defense of minimalism. We saw it arise again in the 1960s and 70s with the voluntary simplicity movement, and then we saw it uh, really spread on the internet. So starting in the early 2000s, when you when you had the sort of blog based minimal movement, so you had Leo Babuda's and Habits and Joshua Becker and Courtney Carver, and then you get to the 2010s and you have my friends Ryan and Joshua, the minimalist, mm-hmm. that really did a, a great job of spreading this idea beyond the blogosphere and into the the wider culture. So it's an idea that's been around. It's basically an idea that says less can be more if the less is really focused intentionally on things you really value. Now. Where minimalism has been primarily focused, especially in the online world, is uh, with possessions and stuff. Right. right? To, to to be a minimalist is get rid of all of this clutter that you need the uh, you know the really large house and every room has to be full of furniture and everything you've ever owned and your closet's not big enough and you have to have a you know a storage center down the street that you store your your leftover your leftover junk. And so classical minimalism says no no get down to the things that you own that bring you a lot of value, Mary Kondo would say spark joy, um, and get rid of the rest. It takes a weight off. You, you actually are going to uh, enjoy your life more. And I realize this idea captures exactly what we need for dealing with the clutter that's happening in people's digital lives right now. 
I mean, there's really been this change. I, I felt it really in the last two years where people, when they're talking about the role of technology in their personal life, they've shifted from being self-deprecating and telling jokes and saying, oh, I'm, I'm addicted to this, to where they're now actually concerned. And people are starting to realize in the last couple of years, you know, I think I am actually uh, significantly reducing the quality of my life because of the time I'm spending in my personal life staring at screens uh, well beyond what I know is useful or healthy. And minimalism is a perfect fit for our digital life because we've cluttered our digital life in the same way that we used to clutter our homes. And the answer is to get more out of doing less, to focus like a laser beam on a small number of carefully selected digital activities to give you huge value and then happily throwing out the rest. Right. So that's minimalism shifted to our digital lives. Now, one of the things that, that comes to mind right away when you talk about this stuff, we talked about this before we jumped in, is your digital presence is fairly sparse already, right? And so, and you talk about this in the book a, li a little bit. I think it comes, it, it's recurring actually, is, you know, w you know, if I want to reach out to you, I mean, I can reach out to you. I've got your contact information. You talked about this in deep work too, you know, the idea of, you know, limiting, creating some boundaries so that, you know, you can focus on deep work. And with this idea of, of you know, social media be a great example of the fact that, you know, if you want to find Cal Newport on the internet, you're going to find you at your blog, you're going to find like your you're going to find interviews, but you're not going to find a Cal Newport Twitter account or a Cal Newport on Facebook or Instagram. Um, how how does that help you or maybe hinder you when you're proposing this idea of, I mean, you, you've lived kind of as a digital minimalist, but then there's these people out there, well, you don't know what it's like, like you haven't done it. Like how, like how can you kind of espouse it uh, or share your your thoughts on it from, from that vantage point when people are saying, well, you've, you know, you've not done it. So how, who are you to say, right? Right. Well, social media is not rocket science, is what I like to say. <laughs> I mean, I understand how it works and I understand what people do on it. And I've been researching and writing about it for six or seven years at this point. So I don't think there's uh, some mystery about what people are doing on Facebook that I don't understand just because uh, I haven't personally experimented with it. Um, I think this notion that if you haven't tried something, you can't talk about its dangers is not an idea that that generalizes very well. I guess by that logic for Nancy Reagan to have her just say no campaign about crack cocaine, she would have had to have tried it first to say, OK, OK, I tried it. I think this is right. This is probably not the right thing to do. Uh, but just to make a, a just to help sort of frame the conversation for the audience, if you know, a lot of your listeners may may know my last my last book, Deep Work. And in case this is useful, I think the right way to think about these two books is uh, Deep Work was about your professional life. Mm. So it was about the role that distraction was playing in your professional life and the value of uh, improving your ability to focus, how that's going to give you a big ROI in your professional life. So it was about the, in essence, the impact of technologies, the unexpected impact of technology on your professional life. One of the big pieces of feedback I got from that book is, yeah, but what about our personal lives? What about the unintentional ways and the technologies that I use outside of work and their impact on my ability to enjoy or have quality time outside of work in my personal life? What about that? And this is what digital minimalism picks up. And mm. so that's sort of the key divide. Deep work is about what to do when you're working. Digital minimalism is about how to gain back more meaning, value and satisfaction in your life outside of work. So let, let me actually I want to piggyback on that a little bit because you know, I found that all of your books, including the one we're talking about, digital minimalism, that I think that the the when when someone suggests that, oh, well, what about like, you know, what about my personal life? I think and this is something I've talked about with lots of people is the idea of, of deep work as well as digital, because I think that that also blends into the professional space. Obviously, digital minimalism does that as well. If you're, especially if you're an entrepreneur, you're, you're, you know, you've got to kind of pick your spots as opposed to trying to scattershot yourself everywhere. But I, I think that, that w the notion of deep work, your book being primarily focused on work, I think that the lessons there can definitely, if you really uh, focus on them or, or, or tap into yourself, you can say, you know, I can, why can't I do this for, for my personal? So I think that some of those answers lie in there. My, my question for you is, do you, why do you feel that people need that, you know, like, okay, this is for work. Give me the guidebook for personal or tell me how to do this because I don't know how to do this. Do you think that, that the onslaught of information or the things that we take in kind of hinder our ability to kind of go, Hey, you know what? I can apply this in other ways that I would not normally have thought. 
rather than having to come to the author or, or you know, look online in a myriad of places to go, oh, you know what, deep work can apply to my personal life. Or, oh, digital minimalism doesn't just need to apply to social media. It needs to apply here, or here, or here. Do, do, are you following me? Uh, yeah, I, I think a lot of what's going on here is that a, a lot of these effects are new. Mm. And it's it's trickier it's trickier than you 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 might imagine to get a handle on them. So one of the big ideas behind digital minimalism, for example, is that the way that a lot of people have been trying to deal with the sense that they're using an unhealthy amount of technology in their personal life is by trying to seek out tips and tricks. Right. Right. So you have a sort of a life hack approach. Well, turn off notifications. Oh, here's an article that says I need to take a, a digital Shabbat. Oh, here's an article that says I need to put this filter on my on my browser. Um, and it's not working. Right. It's not enough. The cultural forces, I really get into this in digital minimalism, uh, the cultural forces and the technological forces that are pushing these things into bigger and bigger fractions of your free time are very powerful. And so this ad hoc approach, is it working? It's just what we saw in the mid 20th century, the second half of the century, where the rise of, of processed food in the West, especially in America, led to this big obesity epidemic. And just telling people, hey, you should try to eat healthier. Here's some tips for exercising. You know, the type of things the government was putting out, like try to eat more vegetables, you know, maybe try to move, was not enough to help people who were really overweight or really unhealthy to become healthy. What they really needed was something that was uh, more strong, like a whole philosophy or lifestyle of health and fitness. Like right. I'm paleo or I do CrossFit or I'm a vegan, right? You needed mm. a philosophy, right? Uh, it wasn't enough to have tips because the, the attraction and the power or processed food was so powerful. That's what's happening in people's digital lives. They need essentially whatever the equivalent is of paleo or vegan or CrossFit. They need something like that in their digital lives, a philosophy of how to live, uh, not just a bunch of tips. And so I don't know if digital minimalism is going to be the best one, but we need to start thinking in terms of philosophy. So this is, the, this is sort of the first lifestyle philosophy for your digital technology. And it says what you should do is severely limit or reduce the time you spend online to focus just on a small number of activities that return really big values for things that you really care about and then be happy missing out on everything else. Like That's the core idea uh, of digital minimalism. Um, and it's sort of a, a powerful idea on which you can organize your whole digital life. We're gonna take a break from the proceedings now to talk about one of our sponsors for this episode, Gusto. Now, everyone loves payday, but loving a payroll provider, well, that's a little weird. Still, small businesses all across the United States of America love running payroll with Gusto. Gusto automatically files and pays your taxes. It's super easy to use, and you can add benefits and HR support to help take care of your team and keep your business safe. It's loyal, it's modern, and you might fall in love yourself. There's a lot of great things that Gusto has to offer. It's surprisingly easy and fast. 98% of customers say switching to Gusto was easy. 91% of customers say running payroll is easier now that they use Gusto. And 72% of customers take five minutes or less to run their payroll with Gusto. Gusto was built for small businesses from the start. Gusto works with you with unlimited payrolls, off-cycle payrolls, multiple states, multiple schedules and pay rates, direct deposit checks you can print yourself, employees and contractors, everything you could need, Gusto does for you. Now, Productivity is Podcast listeners are going to get three months free when they run their first payroll. All you need to do is try a demo and test it out. And you can do that at gusto.com slash timecrafting. That's gusto.com slash timecrafting. Check out Gusto now. You won't be sorry. I'd like to thank Gusto for sponsoring this episode of the Productivity is Podcast. But now let's get back to the show. We've seen this, uh, you know, this identifier that people use with things like bullet journaling or so like I'm a bullet journal. Like if they it's it's almost like they they tether uh, themselves to, you know, I'm a minimalist. Oh, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a bullet journal or I'm a, uh, you know, like you said, I'm paleo. I'm, you know, I'm CrossFit. I mean, when you can do that, then it, that, those philosophies kind of, um, th they become somewhat self, maybe not self-evident, but they're, they're far, they, they trigger far easily because you can say, okay, well, here's, oh, what does this mean? Oh, this means this. It's, it, it lowers the, the decision making process because you've got this philosophical approach that you kind of follow consistently or as consistently as possible, right? 
Yeah, and that's what we need. I think we we had been underestimating the power of these tools to really take over more and more of our life. We we were underestimating just how mm-hmm. powerful they were, just like we underestimated how powerful fast food and junk food is. Right. It's really hard not to eat it. It's really hard not to eat a lot. Uh, so you do need something strong. Uh, and that was really the feedback I was getting. Uh, this feedback I was getting from readers. I mean, you can read deep work, which uh, primarily is saying focus is really important. Don't ignore focus. You really need to focus. You have to train your ability to focus. It's really focused on focus, if you know what I mean. Yep. Um, and you can get the idea out of there that, you know, paying attention to valuable things is more important than lots of more shallower type things. And then that general idea uh, holds for your personal life as well. But man, it's hard. Mm. That's why, you know, in deep work, I have chapter after chapter about, okay, in your work life, how do you schedule your time? How do you put your calendar? You know, I had to give a lot of ideas for how you could make your work life have much more room for focus and how you could train it. It's the same for your personal life. I mean, it's not easy. These these are very powerful forces. There's a reason why you're staring at your phone so much. It's not because you're weak. It's because these things were designed for it. And they're incredibly powerful. So you have to fight fire with fire. Mm-hmm. And and so digital minimalism is a movement. I mean, I came up with the name, but I didn't come up with the idea. There's a lot of people out there that are doing this. And, you know, these are the people you see who uh, – they're not looking at their phone when they're waiting in line. Um, they're they're enjoying something outside and not documenting it. <laughs> they have yep. long conversations with friends where they actually don't even have a phone with them, right? Yep. Uh, they're the guys who are you know building a canoe <laughs> in their <laughs> woodshed and and you know haven't seen their phone in three hours or this type of thing. And man, they have so much more. There's so much more meaning and satisfaction they're getting out of their lives when they take all of this digital noise and say, you know what, you don't get to rule my life anymore. I'm going to wipe the slate clean and I'm going to figure out what I really want to do with my time. And then maybe I'll use some of these tools very selectively to help the stuff I already know is valuable. And that's it. And it, I got to tell you, it is a breath of fresh air uh, compared to what how a lot of people are experiencing life right now. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, you talked about Ryan and, and, and Joshua, you know, the, the minimalist. I remember um, reading about how Ryan basically kept his boxes packed until he actually needed something. Like I, I'm obviously paraphrasing, and I'll link to the the story in there. But basically, he had so much stuff, and then he only opened the boxes when he knew he needed something, and realized he had more things than he he didn't need as much as he had. And and the same thing kind of happened to me recently with my with my laptop. Is uh, during the upgrade process, my my laptop hard drive basically said nope, and uh, I we had to do a fresh install. And uh, my friend Patrick Rohn, who loves to, who's definitely into into this field as well, and he's practiced, you know, th- this idea for a, a long time with this idea of sensible default, <coughs> where, where he's saying, you know, um, when you do a fresh install, like only add the apps that you f- find you miss at the time. Yeah. And you know, the same thing with phones, and and in in the space that we're in, especially especially when you're, I mean, there's so many people talking about apps and tips and stuff like that. People are always looking for that silver bullet app that tool but you know I, we both said this you know the tool is only going to be useful as what you put in it and the attention you pay to it right so um you talk about in the book um there's three car- kind of principles and I, I, can you kind of go over those to kind of ex- explain to people what what those core tenets are who core principles are right i mean these are the three principles that explain why the basic idea of minimalism works why uh Doing less but focusing on better things can can have you end up uh, better off um, than before. And and so there's sort of three big ideas behind minimalism. The first is that clutter is costly. So there there's a negative cost that comes from the sensation of something being cluttered. So we know this in our house, right? If you if you're a hoarder, you can take every individual item in your hoarder house and and give some explanation for why that item is uh, valuable or why you might need it one day. But the overall effect of having your house filled to the brim with junk is incredibly negative, and it swamps the individual little advantages that each thing has in your house. And that's definitely true in people's digital lives. When you when you've cluttered the things you use on your phones and your screens with just dozens and dozens of different types of distractions, they're all pulling at your attention. Even though if you take any one of those apps in isolation and can point out, here's something useful this gives me, the overall negative impact of having so many things constantly pulling out your attention swamps the benefits they each give in isolation. So cluttering up your time and attention in your digital life has an overall negative effect that can swamp the small advantages that each of these things brings. Uh, So that's the first principle. The second is that optimization is important. So a digital minimalist will never say... uh, simply, do I use this technology or not? 
you would never hear a digital minimalist say just, oh, I use Facebook or I don't use Facebook. They care about how and when. So it's not just I'm going to use this or not use this. I also care how am I going to use this and when am I going to use this. They're going to optimize how they use tools to really get that sort of cost-benefit ratio aggressively in their advantage, right? So a digital minimalist might say, uh, I'm not going to sign off of Facebook completely because I belong to a community group and they organize through a Facebook group and I need to know when the meetings are. But they're also not just going to leave it at, and therefore I just use Facebook and two hours a day be on their phone looking at random Facebook. They'll say, okay, I'm going to use Facebook, but how and when am I going to use it? Well, uh, I'm only going to use it on my desktop. I'm going to set up a, a newsfeed eradicator so all I see is the post from that group, and I'm only going to check it two days a week in the evening, maybe 15 total minutes per time per week. right? So they're getting the advantage they want to get out of Facebook in this example – but barely giving it any time. So they've got the cost-benefit ratio aggressively um, in their advantage. So uh, optimization is key. It's not do you use it or not use it, it's how do you use it. Can I chime in here real quick with uh, before yeah. you jump on number three? Because this is something that I started practicing not too long ago when I saw, not because uh, I was spending too much time on Facebook, but because what I was seeing on Facebook was causing me, you know, more, I wouldn't say anxiety, but I was just like, it was one of those, ah, oh, geez, you know, and, and, and anyone listening probably has a sense of what that kind of stuff is. And so um, what I did was I created it. And again, this is again, a, like a framework or a boundary, like you talked about optimize. I said, you know, I, what I want to do is I want to make sure I have a presence there on my, on my, this is on my, my personal profile. So I want to make sure that people know I'm there because some people still use that. That's the only way they can really get in touch with me personally. And so what I did was I put a recurring task in my task app that said, share one cool thing on Facebook every day. And so I have an RSS feed reader and I read several blogs, including yours, Cal. And if something comes up that isn't necessary, whether it's related to time or not, if I think it's cool, I then move it to uh, Instapaper. And, and I save it under a folder called Cool Things to Share on Facebook. So I will stockpile that, right? Yep. And then I'll go into Instapaper, and whenever I see that task pop up that says, hey, Mike, today, don't forget, you want to share one cool thing, I'll go into that folder, and I'll see, instead of seeing 300 things, I'll see 15. And yep. and I will look at it and go, well, which, so out of the 15 things, I'll go, well, which cool thing do I want to share? And because I'm more aware, I'm like, oh, it's the holiday season. So let's share this one because this one's related to the holidays. Or, I mean, even recently it was, um, the, you know, as we're recording this, uh, the the guy that uh, booby trapped um, the, uh, the package thief, package thief versus glitter uh, engineer. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. I'm going to share that. I know probably other people will share it, but I want to know people. I want, I want to just share that. So I just, I go, I click on the Instapaper article and I use Buffer. And Buffer just, or no, I go to the Facebook thing because you can't share third party anymore. Again, that's what Facebook wants. Facebook wants you on the site. They so want you in there. They want yep. you in there. So I actually just, on iOS, I do this all for my iPad. Um, and I hit the Facebook button and that shares it on Facebook. And I just type in what I want. Like, hey, you know, I think that one said karma, baby. And then that's it. And then I hit send and share it on Facebook. I checked it off. It was done. And that's it for the day. Yeah. No more well, Facebook. That- that's classic. That's classic. That's classic digital minimalism, right? So if if you're uh, if you're looking at Facebook on your phone whenever you're bored throughout the day, Facebook is using you, mm-hmm. right? They're they're using you. You're a product in their machine. You're you're a tool. Uh, if you're doing what you're you doing, which is oh yeah, this 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 process, this system, it, you you see Facebook for about five minutes per week. You're using Facebook. Yep. You're like, yep. you're like, all right, you want to make this free? Great. Yep. I'm going to extract some value out of it. My, you're thinking about the cost to benefit ratio and you're like, how can I get this aggressively in my advantage? And that's what you're getting there because your cost is very, very little. You're barely seeing it. It's not this source of anxiety like it used to be. And it's not a source of distractions taking away from more valuable things. And you're getting value out of it. I have a dozens and dozens of stories of other minimalists that have setups just like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's about, you know, I, I call it in the book, the attention resistance, Mm -hmm. but basically it's people like you who are saying, you know what, I'm going to turn these tech companies tools back on them. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use clever tools and filters and systems to like a ninja get in there and use these tools in ways that's really valuable for me without allowing them to turn me into a sort of slack jaw drooling two hours a day, uh, scrolling on my phone zombie. And I call it the attention resistance and it's great. And Facebook and these companies hate it. Oh my God, it's their worst fear. (laughs) Because here's the thing. If if you talk to almost anyone uh, who let's say 
uses Facebook or, or uh, Instagram or something and has like a real reason to use it. And you say, let's really figure out the things that are really important that you would miss, right? That this is the reason why you still use it. 99% of the time, what they list could be satisfied in about 10 to 15 minutes per week of use. And these companies really need you using it about one to two hours per day if they're going to hit their numbers. And so they're terrified whenever you become minimalist and say, wait a second, it's not just do I use Facebook or do I not? But how do I use Facebook? They start to sweat, mm-hmm. right? I mean, that's that is the that's their downfall. Once people start thinking that way, uh, they want you just thinking binary. That's the way they argue. That's the way they defend themselves. They want the argument to always be: Is Facebook useless or not? And then when you say, "Well, I guess it's not useless because I do X," they say, "Great, case closed. Yeah. Don't think about it anymore. <laughs> yep, open up your phone." You know. And I think the digital minimalists are like, "Yeah, not so fast." Well, and and the other thing is th- what I what I like about that framework and and you do give a lot of examples in the book is I don't rely on automation other than my own mental automation. Cause I don't, I also don't necessarily trust automation to work hundred percent of the time because what if, I mean, we've seen this before too. What if the app changes its per, uh, you know, it's API settings. And for those who don't know what that is, like, you know, the protocols and now all of a sudden it's like, Oh, now it doesn't work anymore. Like I talked about with buffer, I can't schedule things. Cause that was my old system. My old system was to say, you know what? I'm going to share a cool thing on Facebook and I'm going to schedule it for the entire week in this two minute span right now. And then Facebook's like, no, no, uh, we want you here. So yeah. that, that, that was eliminated. So instead of me tossing my hands in the air going, oh, well, I guess I'm going to have to go on Facebook every day. I said, no, no, how can I adjust this without necessarily trusting the automation? Because that's something that could be broken. And that's why I'm, I'm a fan of automation to a point, because I think if you automate too much, then you sometimes end up having to track that you become an automation maximalist and you're having to track yep. your automations, right? You spend much more time working on the automations than, <laughs> yeah. Though, of course, for productiv- productivity nerds like us, maybe that's a benefit. <laughs> yeah, I think that there's, I think uh, back to, it's more of a philosophical approach. I, I found that over the years, and we've chatted a, a few occasions, we'll get to the third thing here in a minute, third principle in a minute, but you go from being like a special, like an enthusiast to like a specialist to a strategist. And then at some point, the, there along the way there's been some philosophical stuff that's that's shown up consistently and then eventually you just kind of embrace that part right you know i mean i uh, the idea that i've told people hey you know what you should put on your to-do list or like what i'm like put on your to-do list make a difference in someone's day and make that like a daily recurring task in your to-do list and they're like why would i do that i'm like because you want do you want to do that yes well then put it on your list so that you don't oh i'll probably do that I'm like see probably see there you go <laughs> like yep. and, and you want to get that rather than get the dopamine hit from like the facebook update or getting the happy birthdays from three thousand people on facebook or whatever it is instead if you can check off the box like yes i made a difference in someone's day that's gonna that's gonna change you, you the, the way your, your your optics of your day completely because yep. hey that's important so but most people don't do that and and i want to talk about biases in a bit because i know that that's going to play huge role in this but what's that third principle before we we keep going so the third principle is uh intentionality trumps convenience and the idea here is that uh if you do what a digital minimalist does let's say you you wipe the slate clean just like brian nicodemus packed up all the stuff in his house and put it in a box right Mm -hmm. if you wipe your digital life clean right and then say I'm now only going to add back to stuff that I absolutely need, right? I'm going through my day and like, you know, I really need this. It's going to make a huge difference. And it's it's a really a negative. I don't have it, right? So like Ryan opening up his box to take out his bath towels because, you know, he has to take a shower. Mm-hmm. I need a towel, right? You do that. So digital minimalism, you're doing the same thing with your digital life. You pack everything up. You wipe your day clean. Actually, the book has a process called the digital declutter. I go into detail. You do it 30 days. I've had 1,600 people do this recently. It's very effective. Uh, so you wipe the slate clean, and you only add something back if it is significantly benefiting something that you really, really value. So you're reorienting your life around the things you really value. And tech's main role is just to support the things you really, really value. Yep. If you do this, there's going to be lots of things that used to give you a little bit of benefit or a little bit of convenience that are no longer in your life, right? Um, and so there's a cost to that. But what this principle says is, yeah, things are going to be maybe a little bit less c- convenient, and maybe there's some benefits you used to have that you you don't you no longer have now that you're not using a lot of these tools. But the sense of satisfaction and meaning you get from being so intentional and so in control over your life and what's important is going to swamp the cost of those inconveniences or lost benefits. 
right? So just like if uh, you're like a Jocko Wilnick type guy who's getting up at 4.30 in the morning to do these these serious workouts, right? That's inconvenient and you're going to be tired and then there's some negatives to it. But the sense of mastery and satisfaction you get of I'm killing, I'm getting after it and killing this workout each morning and I'm healthy and that's really important to me, swamps it. And that's why you do it. So intentionality can really trump inconvenience. So don't be so worried about, well, if I don't go on weird Twitter, I might miss some things that are funny. Or, you know, if I'm not using Facebook anymore, I'm, there's a couple things that'll be a little less convenient. Like I won't know about birthdays and there might be occasions where I miss fun being in town or something. That's true. But if the reason you're getting off these services is because you're rebuilding your life around the things you really care about and you refuse to let just digital clutter get in the way of that, that sense of meaning and satisfaction from being so intentional is going to be way, way more beneficial than what you're losing by being much more selective about those digital tools. All right, we're going to take a break from the proceedings once again to talk about another sponsor of the show, UCI Division of Continuing Education. That's the University of California, Irvine's Continuing Education Division. Now, it was established in 1962, and the UCI Division of Continuing Education has been offering education for adult learners in Orange County for over half a century. But you don't just have to live in Orange County to take part in any of the certificate programs or specialized study programs that UCI Division of Continuing Education offers. They maintain over 30,000 enrollments from students worldwide each year and offer hundreds of exciting courses and programs to local, regional, and global constituencies. They offer programs in a wide range of categories as well, from business to IT, healthcare, finance, and law. And courses are taught by expert instructors with industry experience, both online courses and offline courses, so courses in real real world experiences. But the online courses offer flexibility and a real immersive classroom experience as well. So if you're trying to start a new career or build a company or even better develop an appreciation of the world around you, UCI Division of Continuing Education has the resources needed to support your undertakings. So I encourage you to check out what UCI Division of Continuing Education has to offer. Spring quarter is coming up and registrations open. So you'll want to visit ce.uci.edu slash podcast to learn more. That's ce.uci.edu slash podcast to start learning more about what UCI Division of Continuing Education can offer you today. I'd like to thank UCI Division of Continuing Education for sponsoring this episode of the Productivities Podcast. Now, let's get back to the show. Another thing, since we're on Facebook again real quick, is what I've been doing is, and this I think this happens over time for everyone, um, is is the, fa- the birthday updates, right? I talked about this in a talk I did last year in San Diego. And I said, you know, like, what would happen if you didn't say happy birthday to that person? Like on Facebook, what would happen? What would they do? Would they notice it? Would they? Maybe they wouldn't, right? They probably wouldn't because everybody is doing it. So maybe instead of sending it on the putting on the wall, you send them a direct message. Maybe that's the thing you do. Because if your intention is to wish them happy birthday, you want it to kind of stand out a little bit, right? You don't want to just do it because quote, Facebook told you it's their birthday and that's it, right? I've, I have I did that actually today with somebody. Uh, I said, hey, happy birthday. But I sent them a text message because I had their phone number. And what I've started to do with birthdays is because there's a lot of people there that, you know, I no offense to them. I'm just like, okay, you know, we, we're not that close. I'm not necessarily going to take the time to, especially because I'm not spending as much time there. So what I've done is when I get the note, when I see that, because I do see it at one point during the day, is I say, whose birthday is? Oh, it's, 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 you know, uh, Eric Fisher's birthday. Okay. I need to mark that in my calendar as an actual birthday. So that way I make sure that when it is his birthday, I reach out to him. Not on Facebook, but somewhere else. And then instead of the X number of friends that you have, which will be all of them, because that's what face Facebook's getting that and the saying here that you say, OK, now there's 20, 30. Who, who knows how many um, probably want to stop at about the Dunbar number just to be safe, which I think is what, 150, I think. But nonetheless, it, it's more intentional. And yes, it's inconvenient at the time for me to go, oh, OK, I have to write. And that's again, we're going to get into biases here because I think that's huge. Um Oh, it's so inconvenient for me to write down that, you know, that it's Eric's birthday on whatever day it is. And then I got to put it in. I got to put it in my calendar. Oh, but Mike, you're also a guy that doesn't like to get, you know, it's a task. You have to send him a card or something. You want to send him a card. Oh, well, then you got to put it in your task app and make sure it's a recurring reminder. But if I take those two minutes, maybe maybe a little bit longer to do that in that moment or even just, you know, um, get his birthday down in the calendar and then 
add a task to my task list that says review calendar for month of whatever month and, uh, you know, figure out whose birthday cards you need to send or whatever. I mean, you don't have to do that all at once, but it, it's that your intentionality of, you know, yeah. wanting to share that that message with them is so much more so much more impactful, I would I would imagine. And not only that, but it also strengthens the, the idea that and I know you talk about this, too, is to capture things like you want to do that you might forget to do because your brain's going, ah, no, I'll remember that later. Oh, no, it's not convenient right now to write that down. If you don't take care of those intentions and have a way to pay attention to them, then they're going to go away or they won't be served as well as they could be. Right. Right. Which which there's an underlying point there that I think a, an underlying general point that's very important, which is uh, a lot of these tools, especially the ones that make all of their money off of just getting you looking at them. That's how they make their money. They keep us away from distract us and divert us from the actual quality activities that matter and have always mattered. I mean, what you're talking about, about, yeah, you, you have your close friends, you, you have their birthdays on your calendar, you know, you send them a card or do something with them when it's their birthday. That's how we always did it. I mean, mm -hmm. that's just how life worked until about seven years ago. I mean, it, we're so used to this idea that we we're, we're what we we have like a thousand quote unquote friends that we're managing in a database through some sort of you know uh, digital interface where we send these little one bit indicators back and forth about whether we're this whole thing is crazy. I mean, it's a giant uh, Ponzi scheme, but it's just a giant way to get us to stare at advertisements. It's, it's so stupid. Like what you're talking about yep. is how people have. It's called having friends, and it's what people have always done, and well, it works. Well, and the other thing is, is that then what happens is if it, you know on your birthday on Facebook, you're like, oh my god look at all these things i have to scroll through or or the e-cards that people send you're like oh man look they cluttered my inbox with these e-cards but i cannot remember uh, in recent memory where someone would say oh my god i can't believe someone sent me a card in the actual physical mail you yeah. know no now it's a novelty which you're right yeah. it wasn't before <laughs> Analog friendships. That's what we need to go back to. I mean, it's I, it, it it's what we used to do, right? I mean, and and so much of what what's happening now with these screens, we're kind of used to it. But it's like six years old, and it's arbitrary. Mm -hmm. I mean, quality trumps quantity. I, I often get in trouble for saying this, but you know, people have too many friends. Uh, you know, online. Uh, yes, if you don't use social media, like I don't use social media. If you don't use it for friends, there will be. Many fewer people uh, in your life that you you probably really know you know anything about, right? A, a yeah. lot of weak high connections you'll no longer have any contact to, but that's fine because we were never really supposed to have so many weak contact connections in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's a novelty in the history of human sociality that has only been enabled by these tools that have been around for really not that long, uh, less than a decade, any sort of widespread use, right? Uh, less friends, but better relationships. That's what we're evolved for. I mean, that's what works is yeah. that you have good friends and people in your community that maybe are a slightly weaker tie, but you have some sort of actual proximity to physical proximity, or organizational proximity to, and you spend time with people. And when it's their birthday, you're like, we're going out for drinks. And yeah, you, you there's maybe only 10 people or 12 people that you can really do that for, but you that's what you need is mm -hmm. like 10 or 12 people who really know what's going on in your life. You know what's going on in their life. Uh, these companies have convinced us that you need to spend hours a day doing these kind of arbitrary online digital social life curation activities, and especially young people. It's crazy how much yeah. time they've been doing this. Um, but this wasn't a problem that needs solving. No. People had friends. They had community involvement. They had very healthy and happy social lives before 2006 or 2007 when these things started to become widespread. This wasn't a problem that these these tools were solving in a way that, you know, Google Maps solved the problem or Google Search solved the problem that people had. Uh, and, and so I don't mean to rant about it, but I just think it's a um, this is a classic minimalist principle is is get back to just sort of high quality, analog, in-person, old fashioned. There's a touch of retroness to this type of behaviors that we've learned over uh, centuries of cultural evolution really work. You know, spend time with people, talk to people, do nice things for people that you care about, be helpful to them, be a part of your community, be someone that people can depend on, be a leader in your community. These things are a massive source of satisfaction and no amount of happy birthday messages, likes, or other digital social approval indicators will ever make up for them. Now, before we wrap up, Cal, because I know we're, 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 we're running along, but you and I could talk about this stuff for hours. And, and incidentally, incidentally, uh, you know, the idea that uh, you made it, you made a good point there. I mean, it, 
the it doesn't mean if your if your job or your you your time well spent is on a tool a social media tool like if that's something then that's fine I, I, again i think the one thing about minimalism that and again we i keep coming to this term biases but this idea that um you know it doesn't necessarily mean that you're doing it. it this is more about getting aware, right? Like, you know, understanding yeah. what, because I think that a lot of people will say, oh, well, yeah, but I, you know, Twitter is where I spend, you know, it's how I reach out to people. So, okay, that's fine. So again, create some boundaries. Right? I think that the thing that people need to do, and 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 I'd love you to address this as we close wrap up, is, is how do they make, like, they have to make the time to do it and slow slow down so that they can do that. I know you talk about that during the, like in the, in the de decluttering exercise, but how does that, how do you make that sustainable so that it becomes almost second nature or you're able to kind of override those biases that show up, whether, you know, that say, Hey, no, 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 you don't need to do that now. It's fine. Or you can get this new app because it's shiny and new and it has geolocation and you need geolocation because if you don't, then this, how do you keep that, 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 that philosophy sustainable, um, over time. So that way, you know, when these things come, come to you and they will, cause they're not going to stop that you are able to kind of weather the, weather that, that those storms that, that, that come your way. Well, it's really a mindset shift, right? And so this is what we see when you study the traditional minimalist who deal with physical possessions. The, the mindset shift that a traditional minimalist goes through is they, they leave a consumer mindset where, you know, you see something in the store and like, well, that could be useful. Oh, I have to have that. Or I saw an ad for that. And they go into this minimalist mindset where they say, well, I'm wary about clutter. So unless something solves an important problem or provides a massive benefit for something I really care about, my default is don't buy it. And the same thing is happening with digital minimalism. You you are you're switching your mindset when it comes to digital tools from the consumer mindset of ooh, there's something interesting here, or I could imagine that being useful, or that sounds interesting. You shift your mindset from that to my default is I don't want to add something else to my digital life unless it solves an important problem or massively supports something that I really value. And so it's the exact same type of shift that traditional minimalists go through. Uh, it takes a little while to make the shift, but once you do, it's very sustainable, right? Yeah. And, and so that's why I recommend in the book this declutter period where you, you take everything optional technology-wise off your plate for 30 days. So no social media, no news online, no video games, no streaming media. Uh, you, you get off of all of it for, for one month. During that month, you get reacquainted with what really matters to you. What are your values? What do you value? How do you want to spend your time outside of work? What's most important? What are the things that really make your life meaningful and satisfy, uh, satisfying? And then after that's done, you only add back a tool if there's a really strong case for it that, okay, this is really solving a problem or massively supporting something I value. And so as you're saying, I mean, for different people, the answers to those questions are going to be really, really different, mm -hmm. right? So there, there's no particular technology that is 100% um, bad, or 100% good, but what matters is that you're approaching it from this question of, does this massively support something I value? And if not, I don't want to clutter my plate. And so yeah. one, you know, when I answer those questions, I end up with no social media. If someone else answers those questions, well, they might end up with some social media. Like I talk about this uh, artist, Dave, in the book, um, who was using Instagram way too much, like a crutch. Uh, but when he went through this process, he said there there is a kernel of something very, very important in there, which is I can follow some other artist and seeing their work that they post is an important source of creative inspiration. I really value my artistic work. This is really useful. And so he said, I, I am going to add that back into my life. Now, he has the how and when question answered. He doesn't do it on his phone. Uh, he does it for 20 minutes every other day, right? So he has the how and when figured out so that the cost-benefit ratio is aggressively in his, in his favor. But that's an example of someone who is asking those same questions. But because what he values is different than me, he ends up with some social media in his life. So uh, you're right to point out that there's there's no uh, universally good or universally bad things out there um, in terms of these technologies, but there is good approaches and bad approaches. And the minimalist approach of saying, if this doesn't massively support something I value, my default is don't add it to the pile. Don't add it, declutter my digital life. Cal, this has been great. I know we could, we, you and I could talk for hours about this stuff. We've done that before. So we'll have to do it again really soon. Um, the book is Digital Minimalism, Choosing a Focused Life in a Noisy World. Of course, Cal's, Cal's got a bunch of other books as well that you should pick up. Uh, where can people pick up the new book and where else can people keep up with your work? 
So uh, calnewport.com, I've been blogging there for uh, over a decade. I'm a big blog nerd. You can find out about all my books and all the places you can buy them. Um, you can also find uh, Digital Minimalism, you know, wherever you buy your books. Cal, thanks so much for joining me today on the Productivity Podcast. Thank you, Mike. And there you have it. Another great conversation with my friend Cal Newport. You can keep up with everything we're doing here at the podcast by subscribing, but you can check out everything that we talked about during this episode by looking at the show notes in Apple Podcasts or wherever you are listening to this podcast. Maybe you're listening to it on the website, which is productivityist.transistor.fm slash 229. And then you can subscribe right from there and share the episode. Uh, if you're not, if you're listening to this in Apple Podcasts or Stitcher or wherever you're listening to it, you can rate and review the podcast. I'd love it if you did that. John Polstra, my producer and I, were just looking at ratings and reviews today. We'd love to get more. The feedback helps. Uh, it not, not only helps me get better with hosting the show, but it also helps us get more people listening to the show. So if you're willing to leave a rating, which is super easy, or a review, which takes a little bit more effort, but is going to give us a bit more context and, and content, then I'd love it if you would do that. Um, again, big thanks to Cal Newport for joining me. I hope you go up and pick up his his entire body of work, but his new book, Digital Minimalism, definitely check that out. I'd like to thank John Polster for producing this episode of the show. I'd like to thank our sponsors for joining us on the show this week. Of course, Gusto dot com slash time crafting is where you want to go to uh, help out gusto and, and and be part of the gusto family you can get your three months free your first three months for free when you run your first payroll just go to gusto.com slash time crafting check that out and again check out uci division of continuing education that's ce.uci.edu slash podcast check out what they have to offer as well so big thanks to my sponsors and big thanks to you for listening really i, I hope you're back i hope you subscribe to the uh to the podcast and and make sure you don't miss a single episode and if you do that then i'll see you next week thanks so much for joining me until next time i am your host mike vardy reminding you to stop guessing and start going see you later